You're tuned in to RX Radio. This is... Look, there's some stuff that's going to need to get said. I'll fucking say it. <laughs> We're going to say it. It's It's been a long time coming, and someone's going to have to say it, and I think we're the motherfuckers that have to i just it can't we yeah. can't keep can't keep doing this right like this this can't be how things keep going no it's, i mean this is like work. yeah the state of the industry that's this is you know televise this this is us kind of it's getting wild on an now. annual basis we'll just go through and we'll just tear everyone apart just a a purge <laughs> so like here's here's the thing here's the thing here's the thing and and i think of this I, so my indulgence is like world affairs, okay. politics, religion, theocracy. Like when I'm not doing whatever it is we do, like before I go to bed, like my mental indulgence, like some people it's like whatever, TikTok or Hulu or well, I don't even fucking know. I don't, I don't own TV, but like for me, it's world affairs, hmm. history, whatever. And there's there's a trend that I've noticed in opposing viewpoints, right? So like whether it's far left or far right or certain religion and another religion or the Crips versus the Bloods or the Capulets versus the Montagues, whatever. Whenever there's dissension that divides people to like polar ends, it's the responsibility of the moderate on the side of the extreme group that that moderate is represented of when taken to extremes that is responsible for the extreme. So everyone tries to think that like, okay, so let's just go left and right and not even like political orientation, like just using left and right as, you know, just these orthogonal sort of opposites. So like if I am, again, not political, if I am, let's say, and I'll, I'll flip the script. I, if I am center left, my gripe, should be with far left. My gripe should not be with center right or far right, right? So a moderate on the left, like even just like I'm talking left hand, not like left sided politics or trying to dissociate the common use of the word left. My issue should be with the people over there who make it so that pe people misrepresent me as a left of center. That's who my gripe is. Like, I feel the same way. Like, whenever I'm in public and I see someone who fits my APB, what I mean by that is, like, <laughs> if a cop were to put out a call of an all post bulletin describing someone that looks just like me and that guy's doing some dumb shit in public, I'm upset. So, like, any guy, you know, anytime I see a guy at a gym with like a high fit, like, whatever, this, dude, this is out of the box white guy. Whatever this is, I see me everywhere. It's like the Matrix. It's rather than guys in suits. It's just guys with like dumb tattoos and, you know, just too much free time on their hands. Whenever I see a guy like that, just being that guy, like just being a dumb meathead who's like popping off, I'm mad at him. Because I'm like, yo, you represent the extreme of my demographic. That makes it so when I walk into a place, someone asks me about how much I bench or if I'm going to get angry about something. So my gripe is with this guy. My gripe isn't with like whatever the opposite of that is. You know what I mean? You I think you're saying? saying your gripe is with like 25-year-old you. Yes. I hate that guy. <laughs> I hated him then. I just now know about it nine years later. Oh, but shit. it's like – but my point being, because we're going to talk about clinicians today, right? we're going to talk about clinicians in the rehab space. And it's like, we are allowed to, because we are <laughs> on the moderate side of the clinical training world, right? right? And when, and here's something more specific, like Kairos, and I know I've been in the room as you've explained what you do to people uh, and the reluctancy by which you and I tell people what our actual vocation is. Like the hesitancy in which we actually divulge the information of, oh, I am a chiropractor is directly correlated to all of the people on the far crazy periphery who do dumb shit as chiropractors. So it is, it is our job, nay, our responsibility to like shine some light on some crazy shit. And look, I know a lot of chiro students listen to our podcast. I like probably a disproportionate per uh, per thousand users are chiropractic students. 
So yeah. like we are going to today give like a crash course Cole's notes of like, look, you honestly, what it's going to come out, what it's going to come out to be is how to be cool featuring Jordan <laughs> Junta and Jordan Chow, like how to be cool into the professional <laughs> rehab space. And as a byproduct of that, how to be effective. Cause like kind of rule number one in being effective in the rehab space is like being cool because a, that as a litmus test of your decision making <clears throat> is such a proxy to success. Am what I do, am what I am doing or is what I am doing rather cool. Cause if it's not, it's probably not effective. And this is where my gripe is. But before we get into that, um, Prescript level one, which is you know, deep dive in not being stupid from a clinical standpoint and actually developing rehab protocols that are consistent with resistant training principles, um, rather than just being the clinician who opens a spine and sport practice, tucks his polo into his khaki <laughs> Under Armour pants with the with your favorite pair of on running shoes or hokas, calling yourself a uh, from pain to performance somewhere in your tagline, but the spine is like part of your logo and it's in a circle and someone probably made it on Canva. You just don't know what that is yet. And you paid them off of Fiverr for a logo and you know, you're a, you're a sports chiropractor, but like you can't even play beer pong. Like if you're this, like I'm describing, dude, I'm Nailed describing it. half of our graduating class, right? Like I know <laughs> this fucking guy. Like I know this guy well, you know what that guy's not? He's not fucking cool. So if you want to deep dive into that prescript level one and what we've done for our chiropractic sisterhood and brethren is we got it accredited by the NBCE through PACE or uh, continuing education units towards your CEU hours every year to uphold your license as a chiropractor. So if you're in chiropractic college or you're a practicing chiropractor or you know practicing chiropractors that suck. Send in this podcast and be like, yo, you should get your CEUs here, not through the dog shit channels. That's why we did it. That honestly, why we did it was like, yo, I can't, dog. I can't. I remember being in the south of Turkey late June <laughs> one year, and I had to do fucking yeah. 16 hours of CEUs straight. Like I was like midnight. I turned into a pumpkin. It was like some Cinderella shit. And I was just sitting there. I'm like, I'm going to fucking kill myself. If I have to listen to these dipshit old people talk about whatever the fucking research that they made up in some journal, in spine or whatever journal, I was like, dog, we can't. And I, since that um, day, we're like, yo, because you and I have the same birth month, right? Of course, we're the same fucking everything. So yeah. prescript level one is accredited for 16 hours, which you can only do 12 online. So we got you for all your online hours for CEUs. Um, and this is going to be a bit of a crash course because I think part of what we're going to discuss today is the technical side. Like, hey, let's actually take a look at exercise prescription as a serious subset of manual medicine, which I think is an important way to frame it. And then let's take a look at the tactical side. Like, get off Groupon, you fucking idiot, uh. right? Like, maybe untuck your polo. Untuck, I can't believe I have to say this. Untuck your pants from your socks. What universe am I living in when that's yeah. like a thing? I do my right hand to God. I remember getting put in detention in the third grade. They had to make a detention because they're like, who, certainly someone in the third grade won't act out of accordance that will land him in detention. So they made third grade detention for me because Mrs. Paul, my third grade teacher, tucked her track pants into her socks. And I was like, ma'am, I can't listen to you. I can't possibly respect someone. This dude, I'm fucking seven years old. And I'm like, I can't possibly dude, respect oh, someone who wow. tucks their track pants into their white socks. She was just yeah. ahead of her time. I walk down the street in Toronto. Every fucking grown ass man has yeah, like Toronto these tapered. Weird, homie. I got to get out, dog. I got to get out. <laughs> I feel like that one black dude in that movie where they snap the picture <laughs> and his nose starts to bleed. Like it's getting, yeah. it's nuts out here, dog. It's nuts. <laughs> Yeah, but it's like, man. I literally went to Mrs. Paul. I was like, ma'am, I can't, the, the verbatim, ma'am, I can't respect you with your pants tucked into your socks. And Kyra, mm -hmm. be on, like what? Okay, so part of it's going to be technical <laughs> and part of it's going to be tactical. Now, okay, just to close the loop on the prescript. If you, so the opt-in list closes and registration opens on December 2nd. If you are not on the opt-in list, you will not receive the only discount code that we provide. No Black Friday shit. 
this is real. This is real world, right? We're not trying to compete with REI and fucking Patagonia and every what else. No, we don't do any of that bullshit. If you're on the opt-in list, you get a discount. If you're not, and we'll see you in class paying full price. So I would suggest www.pre-group.com. It's on the homepage. Click through the L1. Get your email on the opt-in list. ASAP because December 2nd is closed and then registration is open. So where do you, where do you want to start with this? Because there's, there's a lot to unpack here. Right. I think where I want to start is there's this population of chiropractors, rehab specialists, that are fucking nerds and they've never trained a day in their life. And they act like just because they got a degree, they're an authority in training when they've never actually became an authority in training, right? Like they look like they act like they, their education supersedes actually doing the Mm -hmm. thing in training and getting strong themselves or getting other people strong. That's the thing that's most irritating to me in this, this intersection between rehab and performance training. Right. Like there's these are two different things. And there are people that dedicate their entire life to becoming performance coaches and actually getting people to perform at their highest level. And that's people that we're talking like professional athletics, strength sports, like even people like um, shout out L.A. up in New York. Like L.A. is just a career trainer, man. That dude's fucking turns it out like he's doing numbers and training. But like that's someone who has dedicated their entire life to a singular craft. Now there's someone that takes the academic route and they go, okay, you go, you get your undergrad, you get your graduate degree. You now have a diploma that says that you can put your hands on people essentially is what it is. Like you can do either manual medicine, you can do rehab, but I've dedicated, you know, I have the degree. Yes, you have the degree, but I've dedicated my life to training, like being an authority in training. Like even in school, I spent just as much time in the gym as I did in class. And that's like, you know, that should be skewed way the direction of class. They're like eight hour days. It's like, fuck it. I'm going to cut it at four and spend the other four at the gym. Maybe play some pool with you in between. (laughs) But but I've spent my entire life trying to become an authority in training. And like, that's one of the things that like, I don't know, like that's that's a bold statement to me because and I'm you as well. Like we've been in the room with people that are a fucking an authority when it comes to training. And I'm talking like they walk the walk, they do the thing. They're the best in the world at what they do. So even me like saying that out loud on the podcast, it's like, uh, I'm not that guy, but I'm, I've worked with that guy and I'm pretty fucking good at what I do. And I know how to train that guy. So I'm going to call myself an authority in training. And if anyone wants to say that I'm not, all right, I'll fight you and I'll win. Hmm. (laughs) Um, So that's what I'm talking about. And like people, they, they want to kind of, they want to go this academic route and they want to kind of skip the queue and just kind of jump to the front of the line when it comes to being an authority in training. It's like, no, no, no. You are someone who has now been licensed to start to learn on how to rehab people. Right. Cause that's, that's what it is when you get the diploma. I remember graduating school, starting practice and like, seeing my first patients, like probably the first week in, I'm like, yo, I have no fucking idea how to manage these people. Like I leaned on my training background because I've been training people since I was in college. And I'm like, oh yeah, like I know how to get people stronger. Let me just start there. But like I graduated school and I knew nothing about how to rehab someone. Like everything I learned about rehabbing people, I learned once I was in practice. And then people like they, that's what your diploma is. That's that's your license to start learning how to figure this shit out. It's not a license to jump to the front of the line and say that, oh no, like I'm smarter than the guy that's been doing this for his entire life, or like I understand this better. Cause I I actually ran into a lot of scenarios where I was working with athletes and and uh trainers. And as we were working, as I was working with them and talking to them, like I was learning a lot from them. Like I was pulling from their experience to, to put into my experience as I was working with them. Like I didn't know more than them because they had more experience than I did when it came to like the, the first kind of the first tier of entry into rehab, I think is personal training. Like a lot of people will go to a personal trainer before they'll go to a healthcare specialist. So a lot of personal trainers out there are doing a lot better job at rehabbing clients than these rehab professionals that market themselves that way. That's the thing yeah, that pisses I mean, me off the most. One of my favorite quotes is, in theory, there's no difference. In pro- okay. 
in theory, there's no <laughs> difference between practice and theory, but in practice there is, right? right? And I think what people need to realize when you're coming out of school is this is not a profession that lends itself to the theoretic, right? Like it's not like physics. Like there is yeah. quite literally a subset of physics called theoretical physics, which kind of exists all on paper, right? But they <laughs> need, they need experience. They need practical application of their theory, right? Practical application comes from practitioners, right? You are not a theoretic, right? You're, you are a practitioner. Like that is kind of your defining characteristic as a professional, as a professional. And I think I've said this on the podcast before, but it's something that I, I didn't really understand what was meant when it was said to me. But as I went through and continue to go through my practice, I, it, it started to land and resonate with me. And it's all about how you punctuate the sentence. And so the, the quote was, you practice how you want to practice. Which to me, as like an angry 25-year-old kid, I was like, yeah, practice how you want to practice. Which meant, to my brain, do whatever the fuck you want. And right. whatever the fuck I want, I did. But then it dawned on me over time that it was like, and a lot of this is, and it's going to sound odd, but I think it's a really pertinent tactical conversation to have in this day and age. A lot of me understanding that the, the, the depth of that phrase was me actually creating content and organizing my thoughts around what it is that I actually, because until you start speaking out loud, you don't understand the number of conflicting thoughts that you need to reconcile before you start actually speaking. Like the, the origins of what is now the prescript mm -hmm. level one textbook started with me just writing stuff down. And so many of the early drafts of that textbook were me looking at you know different chapters of things that I had written down and going, how can these thoughts exist in the same brain when, and still be a functioning member of society? So content creation and, and you know long form writing, I think is probably the most valuable uh, form of content creation for the creator of the content, let alone the receiver. Like we obviously enjoy doing the podcast. We've done it for Jesus, I don't know, set eight years now. Probably coming on eight years. Yeah. We've done it up for hundreds of episodes. So this long form creation and the it does far more for us and the synthesization of our thoughts oh, yeah. than it does for you guys, without a doubt. But you know why I know this? Because there was a time where there was no you guys. And we did it anyways. <laughs> yeah. But the inflection point of my ability to relay and communicate to my patients, clients, athletes is directly correlated to this. You know, I had a meeting the other mm -hmm. day with a prospect. Um, I won't name the school, but a really highly touted prospect that's going to come do the combine with us now. And, you know, his father and his uncle were there and they were concerned about some health issues that he had, that he had, you know, he's, he's active roster right now. He's playing his final season. Uh, what will he hope to be his final season and go to the NFL? He will join us in the prescript level three coaches in January. I was down there with Yo Murphy, who runs the Combine program, and Yo and I had met with the the parents of this this athlete, this football player, and we were talking about a particular uh, injury that the the player had, and it's you know in our space, it's it's fairly concerning the injury that he had. The and I was told this during and after the way I communicated to them the mechanism of injury and how we were going to go about you know, treating and training around this and rehab it, if you will, um, landed so well that that was the deciding factor in them trusting us to train their son. To, so this, you know, by this time next year, he will be a household name in the NFL, right? And coming out of the school he's coming out of, playing the way he's playing, just the pedigree of the type of athlete he is. And that will be, you know, obviously we're not going to take any credit for the skill that he brings to the table, but the fact that he gets to spend that time with us now and we get to impart what we've learned all came down to the idea that I practice the way I want to practice, not do whatever the fuck I want. I literally, I drilled like, you know, if you do a martial art discipline or if you are an Olympic weightlifter, or if you're a golfer, like you drill your practice. And that's what you mean by practice. It's not do whatever the fuck you want. It's practice and iterate on the thing that you're doing, right? The way mm -hmm. that I practice is so different now. The way I go into work and I like manage patients and athletes and clients is so different because there was a deliberate iteration. There was a deliberate 
practice of the skill. This is a part of that, right? Now, again, usually the longer form the content, whether it be writing where it started. So the, that, the Prescript textbook started before Prescript, the company and the podcast. But the longer form, the more you get out of it. So I think as a first foray into this idea of like, okay, how to successfully navigate becoming a rehab specialist is you need to practice, iterate, improve upon, understand how you're going to practice, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I talk about, obviously, communication is such an important part about what we do. The skills of an effective communicator are just like the manual skills that come with the rest of our profession, whether it be adjusting or soft tissue work or even exercise prescription. It comes with practice. Now, that is your that is your business card, right? That is your foot in the door. If you are an ineffective communicator, you are not going to be in a good place to get to treat anyone, right? So the first thing I think people should practice when it comes to being a rehab specialist is this communication, right? It is synthesizing their thoughts around, you know, a diagnosis, a prognosis, mechanisms of injury, like, and being able to titrate these conversations up to the level of a professional or a colleague and titrate it down to the level of a father and an uncle concerned about their, you know, their son and nephew's injury coming out of a, a, a division one program and moving into pro sports. Right. So I think that is such a skill. And look, I remember living in Campbell, California, and I remember doing Instagram lives and man, I would record and not like, uh, sorry, Instagram stories. And I would record 15 of them and I would delete them. Would walk <laughs> around the block on Holmes Avenue in California with my dog, you know, just, oh no, that sounded stupid, but I had to practice because I'd much rather do it there on the sidewalk when my dog's taking a shit than do it in front of another person. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like that I think is if, if I were to like, okay, let's, let's put a flag in the ground and say, Hey, you're, you're like a young clinician, chiropractor, physical therapist. You want to get into the rehab space. You want to start incorporating training into part of your practice. The first step I think is getting really good at communicating, right? Getting good at communicating, reconciling, opposing thoughts, contextualizing the way you think, because that's going to directly start to affect the way that you act. Right. And if you are unclear in the way that you think, that lack of clarity will manifest in the way that you act. Right. Like I don't <laughs> yeah. um or ah or do any of that because, dude, it's autopilot. And so yeah. at this point through the pod, I've just sat there and just bop, 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 and I fuck up on here. So when I have these conversations, so that for me, if we're talking rehab specialists and we're talking on the tactical side of like, hey, technical, okay, you know some stuff, you might need to learn how to put it together, but tactical tactile like or, or tactical that's what i think people should at least consider in the early stages yeah yeah i mean the com communication is super important when it comes to this and i think the place that you get confidence in the communication is from actually understanding the process itself and i think that comes from actually trialing the process itself so you kind of you made this statement earlier this, is that like there's no difference between what is it practical or practice in theory in theory but in application, in application theory, and then in application there is, yes, sorry, I'm retarded. But the application is the important part of this, right? Is that how many times have you thought or like looked at say a machine in the gym and like kind of theorized of, oh, this is what I think it'll do. And this is how I think it'll feel. And then you try it and it's completely different or at least different than the way you thought, maybe not completely different, but you're like, eh, I don't think this one will be good. And then you try it out. You're like, oh yeah, this is kind of sick. Like I like this one is and that's that's the difference right there between application and theory. It's like you can think of what this is going to do and how it's going to feel and and what that's going to do in terms of your overall training. But until you try it, you don't fucking know. So that's the biggest thing for me is that every single exercise that I will ever give a client is something that I've done. And I understand the changes that it's going to make because I've felt those changes. So I think that's an important part of this process is that if you're going to be prescribing things to someone – you need to understand how it's going to affect them, the stimulus that that's going to elicit, and when the appropriate time to give them that stimulus is. And that's a lot of that comes from kind of the the technical and tactical side of like communicating, uh, history taking, understanding the the injury that person's coming in with. Yeah, absolutely. But 
on the back side of that, you have to have the experience in understanding the appropriate exercises to give that person so that you can progress them along the way to where they're going. And then that's the other side of it is, is where they're going. If this is someone that, you know, they work at a desk nine to five, then where they're going is not that far down that spectrum of exercise progression, right? It's, it's okay. That might be your, you know, uh, McGill big three Thera band, like plank side plank curl up crowd. But what happens when you're talking to someone that's going to be in the NFL and is going to be a household name? What happens when you're talking to one of the strongest people in the world or someone that's looking for a chance to go to the Olympics? Like that conversation, it's a little bit different because it ends in a different place. And I'm not saying that you have to be that level of athlete to work with that level of athlete. But you have to understand like progressing things to the furthest ends to be able to know how to progress things to the furthest ends effectively. And that's something that I think a lot of people miss when they get into the rehab space is that the rehab space doesn't end when, you know, they're, they're out of pain or they, they check some box in terms of functionality. The rehab space ends when they get back to the place where they can perform at at least the level they came to you with, but ideally a higher level. And that's, you know, that's ideal, right? If if there's going to be certain things that will limit performance overall, but if we're talking like a college football player in the prime of their life, like trying to go to the NFL, like they need to perform at a level level higher than they've ever performed before. And if you don't know how to progress training to the furthest extent, then you're never going to be able to rehab someone to the degree that they need to be rehabbed to, to perform in that atmosphere. Yeah. You got to understand that if you are not rehabbing someone back to stronger than they were, you need to reason that as strong as they were, wasn't strong enough for them to not get hurt. Right. Right. So true rehabilitation has to find a new horizon of strength. Otherwise you're back to the starting line and starting the clock of when the next injury will occur because clearly back to where they were is back to the point in which that they back to the point where they got hurt, right? So like logically, the rehab process needs to set a horizon far further than the strength of them a second before they got injured. Now, obviously, injuries are contextual contact versus non. There's a lot of you know nuances to that conversation. But the fallacy that getting someone back to where they were a second before they got hurt. It's like, okay, well, what about are we just one second away from our next injury then? Right. right. So that's a, that's a, that's already. Right. And look, I would be, and this is the state of affairs in the rehab space. I would be elated if the industry at large could consistently hit the mark of as strong as they were one second prior to them getting injured. But we are so far from that being the mile marker. Like I think we would be held in much higher regard if we could even achieve that, which I deem to be a relatively stupid goal in the rehab space. Like if we are not getting that person stronger than we are one second away from injury again, right? Again, layers, context, nuance, different types of injury, blah, 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 blah. But logically speaking, I think that is a, a sound position to come from. But the, the sad state of affairs is that, you know, clinicians and trainers would both benefit from understanding scope of practice. Because look, you yeah. talked about LA. The yeah. amount of problems LA is capable of solving as a coach. It's like Movement Lab NYC on IG. If I I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to I'm going to fucking make sure I get the handle right because <laughs> it's worth people at home going to follow our boy LA. LA yeah. just crushes it. But I don't think there's a person who understands scope of practice better than LA. And Oh, where the fuck are you, dog? Because there's an underscore in there somewhere. Let's see. I'll look for him, too. Please hold. <laughs> this is very important. It's like movement underscore lab NYC or something like that. Is it like MVMT? No. LA, we got to talk about your marketability, homeboy. Yeah. I think he wants to stay anonymous. Uh, nah, or, what I don't know, man. No, I know he does, but we're not gonna let him. Uh, I got you. You, you, you got. Uh, fuck sakes, LA. All right, well, I'll, I'll spend the whole I, fucking podcast. I got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> Movement. Anyways, 
no one understands scope of practice, in my opinion, quite like LA. And he is able to solve such complex problems with training. Now, the thing is that as a clinician, you have the scope that LA has, right? And to LA's credit, the scope, all the, the majority of the scope you need to solve very complex problems lies within a PT certification, right? Yeah. Like that is to me, I would say 95% of the time I'm working with an athlete, I'm working within a scope of a personal trainer. Yeah. Period. I don't need to call the chiropractic board. I don't, I'm just being a trainer doing training things. But the scope is so broad if you let it, right? So I made this comparison the other day we were talking about. It. I'm not sure if I made it on the podcast because I don't know what of my life is recorded versus not. But when you understand movement as a system, or maybe better yet, when you understand the neuromusculoskeletal system and all that entails, right? From, from fascia to ligaments to tendons, connective tissue, cartilage, and all that. When you understand it, you start to see it as a system very similar to like the endocrine system, right? So the endocrine system, uh, you know, if you were to look at like uh, insulin and blood glucose, and you think about how little insulin it takes, right? Like if you were to look at, you know, I use per kilogram, and you're like, wow, there's like a little bit of fluid. If I inject this into someone and their blood sugar is high, could save their life. Or the opposite, this little bit of fluid, if their blood sugar is low, if I inject that into them, it could kill them. Training and the neuromusculoskeletal system has a sensitive reaction to dose and response as something like the endocrine system, right? Now, we might not be dealing with life or death in the acute phases, but you know, long term, these decisions of dosing the right intervention with the right person really add up to some severe consequences. I had this question posed to me the other day about the L3, and it was something I, I've thought a lot about. Like, hey, is Prescript just about training professionals? It's like, no, Prescript's about becoming a professional. And it's when you deal with people whose, you know, their livelihood is on the line, their, their family's future, both past and present, are going to be drastically affected by the, the outcomes of your training. People step up, right? They, they step up and they're like, oh shit, like, are we making the right decision? Because every decision in an eight-week combine prep could be the difference between generational wealth or, you know, having to find a job with your communications degree out of a Div 1 school. Like, that's a massive inflection point for an individual and the people around. So it's about becoming a professional. And it's taking the neuromusculoskeletal system as a bodily system as serious as one would take the endocrine system. Right, an endocrinologist does not haphazardly approach the prescription of their drug of choice. Right, like if you miss the mark in the other direction, and you give someone, you know, in, you give someone who's hyperthyrotic a you know a heavy dose of T three and T four, it's like, well, I could really cause some problems. You give it to someone who's hypothyrotic. And now we're starting to level off and balance the hormone system. And, and, you know, those who may be more akin or attuned to endocrinology, this might be oversimplifying the analogy. But the point is, there's a sensitivity to dose response adaptation to movement that needs to be seen in as high a priority as something like the endocrine system, because the neuromusculoskeletal system and all that entails is equally as sensitive, albeit the ramifications not flatlining someone in the gym you got to understand the, the the damage done by opportunity costs of stacking up anything other than wins in your profession, right? Like the, the amount of changes you can make. It's funny. I had someone the other day talk to me. Uh, it was an L3 coach and they were, they were describing to me and they actually showed me the video of, on their phone, uh, a client sending them a video crying because they were finally able to do something without pain. And I was like, man, make a folder in your phone because that'll be the rest of your life. Because you can just save those. I have a folder in my phone. The same thing. Voice notes and videos of people messaging me. I thought I was going to have to get surgery. I, I already had surgery. I thought I was going to have to get another one. But if you treat, treat, 
the neuromusculoskeletal system with as much respect and deference as someone would treat the endocrine system, you start to stack up W's and those W's start to become very noticeable, as noticeable as, you know, the, the, the sigh of relief of someone who administers insulin when their blood sugar is high and they can feel all the physiological regulation that comes with the administration of that dose in that particular time. Movement's the exact same way. So it's like, you know, the, I guess the takeaway message is if you don't act like your career matters, it never will. (laughs) Yeah, that's absolutely fucking true. Right? Like it's just like as simple (laughs) as that, right? Some people like go in and they crack their necks and they go over the, you know, they fucking work at the joint or whatever and they're relatively unfulfilled. And it's like, all right, man, good luck with your real estate exam. You fucking loser. Like that's where you're, you know what I mean? (laughs) But like, that's what it is. Where it's like, if yeah. you treat it like it matters, then it does. Because of yeah. course. Yeah, absolutely. And these are impactful changes you can make on people's lives. Like, And to, to further your point about us not just like training professional athletes, like a lot of my clientele is just people. Just people that live life on a day-to-day basis. And I fucking love working with those people because they're the people. And we've had this conversation when I was up there in Toronto. Like they're the people... I have a 62 year old woman that is, she's been a client of mine for like a year now and she fell this last weekend. Like it's not a good thing when old people fall, but she like fucked up her knee, fucked up her wrist. She's all bruised up right now. And she texts me and she's like, Hey, I fell this weekend. I'm not gonna be able to make it in this week, but I just want to thank you because the training that we've been doing is the only reason that I haven't broken a bone or I didn't injure myself worse when I fell. And I'm like, yo, that's fucking sick. Like I'm, I'm 62. Crying, dog. Right, right. Yeah, you break a hip at 62, like you're dead before 70, like statistically. Yeah. So it's like, it's things like that, that that's why this stuff matters. It's because like, if you just have this person doing like super basic in between rehab stuff, and you're not actually working on progressing them in terms of like physiologically building strength, but also like, education on how you can move the the psychology around pain as well like that's that's rehab it's not just you know creating small physical changes it's it's creating large changes in terms of physiology in terms of psychology in terms of perception and education around movement like that's an all-encompassing view on rehab like this is a 62 year old woman i have her doing rdls and i have her doing right now she's doing like unsupported bilaterally loaded lunges like if you can get an, an older person to do this shit, like that's going to increase their quality of life a lot. Like they're they're going to live for probably longer because of that. They're going to have a higher quality of life. They're going to be able to do more on a day to day basis. Like that's impactful shit. And those are clients that will they will they will speak your praises forever. Like talk about building a business. Like one client like that that you make a change like that, she's going to tell everyone, everyone that she knows that they have to come see you. So it's like the there's different degrees of this stuff, but that's what it's being a professional and understanding how to do this and scale it to to any stimulus level that's necessary. Because it's dude, it's funny as hell. I t- I tell her all the time. I'm like, yo, when I work with some of these NFL dudes, like we're doing the same shit, like literally some of the same exact progressions. And that's it's interesting because these guys perform at such a high level, but there's such gaps in some of their I don't even want to say education, but like proprioceptive awareness around positioning or like movement pattern biases that they have because of the demands of their sport, that there's like these very basic gaps that you can fill and that's going to increase perform, like performance is going to go through the roof with these guys. But like that could just be getting out of bed for someone else. And it's, it's interesting to me to see how like there's the, the, the specific body that you're working with is going to be different. But a lot of times you see these things on repeat and that's like, Dude, when we first started this company, we were a training company and we started because like we would just fucking commiserate week after week. Like I'm, I'm saying the same shit. Everyone that comes in, I'm saying the same shit week over week. So we started to put together like training programs to fix the problems that we would see every fucking day. And that's like when we started to pick up some momentum and like, like, yo, it's all right. Now it's not the training. It's the education side of this that we need to double down on. And that's like, that's, I think, is a big opportunity for someone that's, you know, you're young, you're in the rehab space is like focus on education because 
that is there there's things that, that are going to take care of symptoms there's going to be short-term fixes like massage uh uh chiropractic whatever even like stretches and exercises there's gonna be things that manage these things long term which is like probably just a good exercise program and regimen but then the actual treatment for something like this is educating someone on how they can become self-sufficient and they can sort this out on their own the next time that it pops up because if they're prone to this happening one time they're going to be prone to this happening for probably the rest of their life. And that's not the same with all injuries. There's always caveats to these statements, but but if someone has an injury that they're prone to get, if they're prone to get low back pain with deadlifting, then fucking teach them how to deadlift. Teach them how they can control their core or teach them how they can modify that exercise so that they now have three different strategies to prevent this from happening in the future. And that's that's the kind of the check mark when rehab is done. It's not only when you take someone to pre-injury levels of performance, but take them and give them the potential to go past that. But then when you also educate them on how to be self-sufficient so that this doesn't keep happening to them. Yeah. And there's, there is a subset, although the clinical world and uh, we self-select for interacting with the clinical world that fucks with this type of language. So I don't want to speak this into an echo chamber. So if you're a clinician and one of your friends is like, old school and like doesn't do exercise, send this to them. And so we can talk some sense into them because rehab and treatment are the same thing. You yeah. cannot treat someone. If you are treating someone and you have a necessity to do so, there is an injury present and the rehabilitation and treatment process is, is the same. If you are treating someone, you are rehabbing them. So when you are treating someone and you are not including resistance training into your treatment, you are not treating them. And yeah. it's ironic to me because what I find in the clinical space of manual medicine, there is this very, uh, I'm going to air quote the word like purist, like pure to the spoken word of the inceptions of each discipline of manual medicine, whether it be osteopathy, whether it be chiropractic, whether it be physical therapy. Uh, physical therapy is a little bit different, but they are sometimes some of the more egregious offenders is, look, old school people who are just hands-on is negligent. It's malpractice in my opinion. It's 100% like that is not okay. like there's enough research out of even just the analgesic effect of exercise and from a pain management perspective that if you are not prescribing exercise as a clinician, you are, you are not abiding by best practices, period. So there are people yeah. who fly a very proud flag of being, you know, a set of hands and only working passive modalities. It's like, sorry, you can't do that anymore. There's enough research stacked up and there's enough evidence, you know, obviously anecdotally there's, there's more, but not that there needs to be where you cannot in good faith, take someone's money as a clinician and not include exercise into their treatment. Right. Like, yeah. and the, the, the ironic part to me with that is the clinicians who claim to be this more purist, hands on approach, passive modality, whatever it is, they tend to be the ones who are the most antithetical philosophically to the Western medicine approach. And I'm like, mm -hmm. no, 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 hold, hold, hold on, hold on. You don't get to fucking, you don't get to go on some tirade about vaccines and then also <laughs> be someone who doesn't prescribe exercise. Because you are just the manual equivalent of, of them. And it is always those people who are like banging the fucking vaccine autism drum that are also the ones that are like, you know, we're just going to, we're going to let the innate flow and I'm going to adjust your neck. Like, bitch, you're the same. Give me the polio vaccine and get me away from this fucking guy wearing a fedora <laughs> where it's like, you know, there's a, again, coming back to my initial analogy, it's like there's a moderate of center slant to either side where you look, you know, you want to, I don't even want to go down like the vaccine route because it's frankly not worth it in my opinion. But like, I'm much more upset with the guy who is not prescribing exercise in our world than if, than a GP on the other side that goes, yeah, look, you know, mumps, measles, and rubella is like a real problem if a kid gets it. Right. Yeah. So like, it's kind of your choice. If you want to, we recommend this. There's like 43 that we can give you, 
But like, you know, there's maybe six or seven that are probably like, hey, you know, I'm way on more on the side, even though I'm, you know, the, through a dividing line of scope of practice, I am aligned with Buddy with the fedora who just cracks me up. But I align philosophically more with this guy on the other side of the aisle. And I, it's not my job to denounce the practices of people prescribing 85 vaccines to infants, but it is my job to look at this guy over here and be like, can you fucking do a squat, please? Like, can you not stop making me look bad by just doing your hands-on crystals approach? I'll let homeboy on the other side, something, something MD be like, yo, do we need to do fucking 85 vaccines in the first two years? Is that really necessary? Like, can we, can we trim, can we prune that list a little bit? Like, I'll leave that to him and he can go fight that fight. And what it's on us to be like, Hey, yo dog, like, okay, I get you want to be all hands-on and innate and old school, but what you're actually doing now, given what we know about best practices is uh, negligent. So do you want to be practicing this negligent style of of out of date manual therapy, or do you want to actually treat people? Uh, Because treatment now, given what we know and how effective exercise is, if it's not, if it doesn't have exercise, it's not treatment. And if it's not that to me, it's malpractice because what are you taking their money for if you're not treating them? So that's like my thing. It's like, look, we, we live, we've made a decision as clinicians to not go to medical school. Why? Because it's harder obviously. Like, can we just not beat around? Like, I hate, dude, I can't, I can't. The number of people who I've had, yeah, so I was going to go to med school. <laughs> but, but thank God I'm you did. Fucking dumb. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, dot, 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 because I'm way too fucking dumb. Like, let me, dude, how many times have you come across that? Dude, some of the fucking shems we graduated with pulled that line. Yeah, I was like pre med, and then you, yeah, then you realize pre med was too hard. You're like, yo, post med must be really hard. Oh, uh, what's this over <laughs> here? Like, okay, I'm gonna go do that. Like, let's just not call it anything else but what it is. Anyone who starts, I was going to do dot dot dot, but and they go on some like, you know, I just couldn't align with the oh, align with the what the IQ it took to fucking pass the MCATs. You fucking retard. Like, <laughs> I do. <laughs> kills me bro like i don't care man like i get to go to work dressed like that i'm working right now what up yeah (laughs) no scrubs tlc no stethoscope either i don't give a fuck you got something that requires that go see my boy over there fighting the good fight trying to get the vaccines down to whatever right like there's good people in the western medicine space and it just it it kills me to be like just just own it but the thing is when you own it you open yourself up to the real scope of practice Right. Like when you, when people are out there trying to be like, you know, with the white coat on, the, you know, this is how you tell real, right quick on Instagram. If you ever, ever come across someone who's doctor something without the initials after Cairo, Hondo P, like not even, not oh, even yeah, a yeah. question. Like oh, I'm doctor so and so. I'm like functional. Oh, oh, oh. Where'd you go to Cairo school, dog? Where'd you go to Cairo school? <laughs> ah, you went to Life West, you stupid bitch. Like it's just not even a question. But it's like the second you lose that, like, dude, I'm fucking, I, my sister's like an actual doctor, MD, like fucking ER room stuff. She called me. She's like, yo, we had to like make a kidney for someone. I said, why? So it was just kind of a bag. And we just like grabbed <laughs> a bunch of shit into a bag. And I was like, that's nuts, dog. I did decline dumbbell press with someone today and she's like that's good because you're retarded you would have fucked up the kidney bag for sure i was like word and you know we're living well but like just just lose like just drop it like just drop it like and even too like you know we have a like prescript is a coaching certification i've what we we will and spoiler alert we will be going into the personal training accreditation space and i cannot wait for that so you know spoiler alert in 2025 we will be adjacent to NASM and NSCA with an evaluation and a course that is going to revamp what it means to be a personal trainer. And I'm so, I've been thinking about this a lot because Prescript right now lives in this coaching world where everyone is a trainer or of some discipline of a clinician or, uh, you know, Cairo PT, whatever. But I'm excited to like get back to the personal training profession and make it something where pe- there's a pride in it. 
where it's like, because people are, you know, we use the word coach because we go so multidisciplinary with our continuing education, right? We're accredited CEU providers across multiple disciplines from personal trainer to strength and conditioning coach to physical therapist to chiropractor. So like can't pigeonhole. So we use the word coach because they all have a coaching aspect to what they do. But, you know, our primary demographic is going to be personal trainers because the scope in which they practice at, I think, is the most meaningful. So the PSCPT is going to be a revival of people being person. No one, no one calls himself a personal trainer anymore. Similar to like a, I don't know, a rel- maybe it's a shame similar to what we feel about chiropractors because like some personal trainers were nuts and charlatans and just like most chiros are nuts and charlatans. But we're trying to move the needle with the CEUs with chiropractic. We're going to try and move the needle with PT, but it, or personal training. But it's like you just gotta like you gotta you, you know you are who you are in this world. It's like one of my favorite. I think it's a Denzel from um, Man uh, Man on Fire, or maybe it was Training Day. It's like you are who you are in this world, and it's like yeah, that. And it's like, dude, just be this. So the second, like, and maybe we'll, we'll try and summarize this to like a lesson for clinicians or Cairo specifically. It's like, you're, I'll tell you what you're not. You're not a fucking doctor. Relax. I stopped being the whole, like, you know what that allows you to do fundamentally in those listening? All that does is when they see doctor so-and-so, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Aetna, Cigna, whatever, Medicaid, Medi-Cal, Med- all of those things, that's the whole game right there. And like, okay, you can order blood labs and you can order images. Sick. Okay. Yeah. When I call Sunnyvale radiology, it's Dr. Jordan Shallow. Anything shy of that, flight manifest, fuck that. Fuck that. Ain't no one's knee hurt that bad that I got to ruin my fucking 10-hour flight to the Czech Republic doing knee rehab at 40,000 feet. Nope. It's Jordan Shallow. Thank you kindly. I'm sitting in... 4C, I'm watching Harry Potter. I'm sending you into messages. Like lose the like lose the attachment to that. How many people do you know that got into it because it's the backdoor entrance into the doctor title? Now, mind you, look, Instagram, absolutely. Dr. Jordan Shallow, sure, whatever. But Dr. Jordan Shallow, DC. So y'all know I'm not trying to be something I'm not. But it's <laughs> like, I think there'd be so much net benefit to the end user of chiropractors if by tomorrow, everyone just, if we were still allowed to uh, request images and request uh, like advanced test blood labs and whatever, but we lost a doctor title, I think you would separate the wheat from the chaff. A lot of people just getting into it, trying to book their flights on, you know, United Airlines with the sir, the doctor, whatever, whatever. It's like the fuck who gives a shit? You don't want that smoke, dog. You do not want that smoke. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one thing, it was somewhere in that rant along the way. One thing that I want to pull out and highlight is like, in terms of scope of practice, there's there's things that you can do and there's things that you should do. And there's things that you shouldn't do, right? It's, there, there is scope of practice, but then there's also ability within that scope of practice, right? And I've referred out to other chiros before, to, uh, to surgeons before, to to PTs, all types of people. And I can tell you, like, if you're young in the rehab space, if you have a degree, even if you're just not just a personal trainer, because I I have a lot of respect for personal trainers. Um, And to your point, I when people ask what I do, I don't tell them I'm a chiropractor. I'm not Dr. Jordan Junta. I tell them I'm a personal trainer. So it's not I'm not saying if you're just a personal trainer, like in any sort of dig, but if you are a personal trainer, like build professional relationships. Co-managing clients is going to be another one of your best referral sources. Like if you can build trust with the client and if you can find a relationship with another practitioner of like, hey, this is what I do. I'm really good at this, but I don't fuck with this stuff. And I know you're good at that. And it chances are if they're really good at that other thing that you're not good at, they're probably not great at the thing that you do either. So that can be a really good relationship to help co-manage clients and to be mutually beneficial, not just for you and that other practitioner, but for the client as well, because then they're going to get someone who specializes in the services that they need. So also understanding like, yes, your scope of practice might be X, but if you can't do the th- all of the things under that scope of practice, that's okay. As long as you refer out to someone else who can like, don't just pretend that you can do them just because it's under your scope of practice. And that's what I see a lot of these people, like kind of how I started off is the people that try to skip that cue and say like, 
I'm a performance specialist now just because I have a degree. The, yeah, maybe that's under your scope of practice, but it doesn't mean you're good at it. And there's definitely someone better than you at it, especially if you wear a polo and tuck it into your khakis or tuck it into your socks and wear your hokas. Like, you're, you're a loser. So let someone that's actually strong train them to be strong. And even like I've co-managed clients on the rehab side that have coaches that I still think I could do a better job at being their their strength coach or like their performance coach than their coach. But there's also this psychological benefit to they have the buy and they have the trust with this person. So I'm not going to disrupt that because it's I'm not going to be able to disrupt that and then gain that same trust with that person. That's kind of a shitty thing to do. Also, if someone sends you a client to like just take their client, be like, oh, no, your trainer is retarded. I'm going to just work with me now. But like that's that's a relationship that you can develop. And that way, like maybe the best thing is to have you in the mix if you don't necessarily think that their coach is doing the right stuff is that you can still kind of like backdoor and, and get them to do things that they need to be doing that are going to be beneficial to them overall. But I don't know. That's getting a little bit going on a bit of a tangent there. But the main thing is like understanding that if you don't know how to do something, even if it's in your scope, there's someone that can do it better. So refer out and co-manage with that person and everyone's going to win in that situation. Yeah. And I think the, look at the end of the day, the only person that needs to win is your patient. Right. So like I had one of the most fun weeks of my career last week because, you know, we're out, we're out at, uh, we're out in Tampa. We're with yo with Killian and Jorge was there. And I was like, okay, what can I do that the others can't? And what can they do that I can't? Right. So it's like, I just did all the manual work and soft tissue. I dished the rock to Jorge. I mean, Jorge is tremendously gifted at what he does. He's probably one of the smartest coaches. That's why he works with us at Prescript because we hold him in such high regard as Killian. But I was like, okay, what is Jorge? like? Then this is like the thing I want coaches to hear is there was a, an axiom that was going around that – about specialization, right? And the, it was it went something to the effect of specialization is for insects, meaning that like you want to be a generalist. And it's like, look, I dish the rock to Jorge. I mean, mind you, he's brilliant, but he also speaks Spanish. Every baseball player I work with speaks fucking Spanish as their native language. So it's like, wh who who needs to win? I don't care if I win. Like I win if the client wins. That's my, we are directly correlated. So if I can be like, okay, I have time, I could do, some of the exercise stuff, or I can be like, Hey, Jorge, this is what I found. He can do the, he can do the exercise stuff as good as I can, but he can do it. Hablo el Spanol. And <laughs> what a better experience. Like you could literally see the comfortability of that relationship was they're no longer fighting for the English word, right? Like we got some cat from Panama, like clearly English. And the thing is they play on baseball teams with other Spanish dudes. Right. Yeah. So it's just w one big bad bunny fiesta all the time <laughs> and a, a English word spoken. So El Gringo shows up and is trying to sit there and say the English language slower. Like that's how Spanish works. And I just go, yo, my boy Jorge, the Hoyas, Big Poppy the third. All right, commence. I'm going to go <laughs> treat the next guy and then I'll dish the rock off to him. So it's, you know, this idea of, and I see it, and I see it at every level of communication primarily where we started at the level of social media content creation. How generic down the center of the pipe can you be with some of like the way people create content? It's like, you're not talking to anyone. You think you're talking to everyone. You're actually talking to no people. And there's nothing more important when you're dealing with someone in pain than the experience of them feeling seen, mm -hmm. right? If you are just going 10,000 feet and like the spray and pray approach to like, are you a person between the age of one and 100, right? Like, do you have, like, what do you, who, you're, dude, you're losing everyone. Because the person who's like in pain needs you to understand every variable of their experience, right? That right. understanding, that feeling of being seen by you, that specificity means that what you're bringing to the table is a solution made for them, right? Now, look, you know, there are you know, common things present commonly. There are generalities to the way that, you know, elbow or shoulder or neck or hip or low back they're present. Sure. But it's the communication that has to be 
to be detailed. So like, do not be afraid to be a specialist. If you're a clinician, by definition, you're a specialist, but understand your specialty includes resistance training, right? That is part of your specialty, right? Mm -hmm. Like do not zoom in and like, well, I have just adjust. And like, look, this is, this is the thing that people just adjust the cervical spine. What? In uh, what you dude, like you should be a barista by <laughs> maybe I'm by Easter by drink. Easter of next year, you should be a barista. If that's your whole stick, because it's like, you know, understand that yes, you are a specialist. What are you a specialist in? You should be a specialist in treatment of musculoskeletal, neuromusculoskeletal system and all that entails, right? Like you can't fractionate that down to the level of mis or malpractice. Because to me, an upper cervical spine practitioner, it, that's malpractice. Someone comes to you, for, if of course you're not just being, like, okay, you need to go to this person for that, this person for that. You need to, as a primary entrance clinician, you are responsible for the, the, the management of that client's care, whether that is all in-house or not. So you need to understand that, look, if it is not occurring under your umbrella, you need to make sure that exercise is being prescribed in some way, shape, or fashion. If you know if you are just unbothered by it, that's your choice. But you need to make sure that somewhere in that process of treating that patient, you that there is exercise in there somewhere. I would argue that most people who don't want to do exercise are lazy and or greedy. It's like, look, trust me, trust me, trust me. You can charge way more when you include exercise. Why? Because you're actually getting results. Yeah. That's it. All right. I'm, I don't even know where. Okay. Can we try and recap this? E, um, yeah. So we start off with, I mean, don't be a pussy. Always. Yeah, but always. Every understanding that your degree that. opens the door for you to start practicing what you're doing. It doesn't right. certify you to jump the queue or be the guy in that profession, that's it's you're at the starting line and you're starting from a deficit because you don't have experience doing the thing that you say you can do. So right. understand, right. yeah, yeah, understand that and get down the trenches, get that experience, like work with people, be honest about what you know, what you don't know. Uh, from there, we talked a lot about like scope and like the kind of actually putting things into practice, like actually applying it. So make sure that you're practicing within your scope, know your scope, understand that, you know, there's going to be things within your scope that maybe you're not equipped to deal with. So referring those out, um, communication was in there also big, like, you, yeah, if you want to get buy-in with your clients, you, you have to be able to communicate in a way that they're going to hear you and they're going to feel heard as well. That's, you know, that's where buy-in starts is that they need to trust that you can do what you're saying that you can do. And for you to be confident enough to, to convey that to them in a way that they're going to believe you is you, you need to be able to deliver on that or else you're just straight up lying to them. There's no, there's no trust in that. Yeah. I mean, uh, apologies for my, I'm tethering this whole thing off my cell phone. So if you've seen me that's on it. my phone, it's, this episode has cost me about thirty dollars in data roaming fees because I've had to keep a, like getting speed when it's because I'm out of country. My phone's anyway, but yeah, like I can't believe that this has to be said. But every single time I'm on socials and I see a what I will call like a grasping clinician trying to build some sort of relevance or business or both in the rehab space, it's like you you'd be mindful. If for no other reason than to be more successful, even if it's selfish, like even if you're just doing all of this to make the bag, the straightest way to the bag is through the best results, period. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's no, it's so regardless of what your motives are, you know, whether you're someone who is a purist who wants to, you know, work with the, the best athletes and wants to sacrifice like they have to be the professionals that they are in the discipline that they excel at. Or it's you're just some greedy fucker who wants to fucking make a shit ton of money. It's like, great. Okay. All of y'all get together because the playbook is the exact same. The playbook is the playbook is get results. And it's like, you know, whether it's anecdotal or whether it's research based, guess what? What you're gonna do? Yeah, it's the same thing, right? Like the the nerdiest of nerdy clinicians who dives in and really understands well conducted, high 
quality research. And someone who goes, yeah, I don't know. I've just been like working out for a long time and I'm kind of a personal trainer with an advanced degree. Those ways of practicing should look exactly the same, right? So like however you want to cut it, you're a, you're a stupid bro trainer that just wants to get the bag. Great. Learn how to practice better using exercise. You're a nerdy trainer that just wants to be a purist and work with the best and get results. Great. Your practice has to include exercise. Any combination of those things ends up with you needing an intimate understanding of how resistance training operates within the scope you already have. So if you're a clinician and you do not want to go down this route, you are actually not a clinician. You're a barista and you just don't know it yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. That being said, get your shit together. Head on over to prescript.com, opt in list, put your name down. You get an email on December 2nd. It's the only discount we offer. Registration opens December 2nd. Class starts January 27th, first semester of 2025. I want to see clinicians in there because I want to one day sit on an airplane and someone goes, Hey, what do you do? And say, Oh, I'm a chiropractor. And they say, That's great. Because what I say now is, I'm a drug dealer. And people say, That makes sense. And then they put their headphones on. Uh, so <laughs> make my dream a reality. Um, but without any further ado, we'll leave it for this week. Uh, appreciate you guys hanging out. Um, uh, iTunes, Spotify. We're so bad at this. We're so bad. Yeah. Please keep listening. Tell your friends to listen, like, subscribe, share. Thanks for being here. I'm sorry for how abrasive I am. So the desperation in our closing speech is bad. We're doing all right. We're doing all right. I think this is the trick is you just, once we're old, people will listen. Like, and it's been a trend. Mm -hmm. Like people listen to us more because we're older. Like we've been banging on this drum for a decade. And yeah. it's like, oh, they're still there. All right. All right. What do they have to say? Yeah, I guess so like, so. once we get to the eight, I don't think it'll take that long. Like I think when I look at the health and fitness top 10. Yeah. I average age 60, 60, 55. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Probably like, dude, I'm seeing a lot of gray hairs. I'm seeing I a know. lot of gray hairs. Like when I go into the, 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 the Spotify charts, Oof. it's a lot of old people. I was like, all right, well, fine. Like, as long as how long you think before, before we're both just gray on this podcast, like the dog, we're not gray now me and you. Nah, nah, man. Dude, look you at you. Think? It's the best you've ever looked. Stop it. Oh, Come on. Thanks. Yeah. Every, thanks, how, look, my, my Loki, how many times? How many times? Well, yeah, we'll get that under control. How many times do we got to call? I'm like, yo, you, know, you just got, you just look good. Thanks, you know when man. you didn't look yeah. good? 10 years ago, you <laughs> look <Yeah>. terrible. <laughs> you look so, you, so you all don't know this about Jay because, you know, he, he's the more presentable of the two of us. But when Jay's had like a bad week, his, there's no difference between his lower eyelashes and his beard. It's one <laughs> thing. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> What is you can, his eyebrow is part of his beard. It's yeah. just one caveman like thing. But you look right. The difference was I took the time to get good at my job so I can afford haircuts now. Big, big. Yeah, exactly. Because there's a time there where the intersection of, of personal hygiene and Oof. professional skill set was we were running away from one another. Yeah. It's like, man, we're getting good, but it's costing you, us our lives. Uh, so don't be like us. Learn from our mistakes. But I think on the grade, dude, I think I remember being in Turkey for my 31st, 32nd birthday. We turned 35 next year, maybe 32nd. And I had one gray beard hair. Haven't seen one since. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. I get, I get here and there, like so, little ones, but they're not... Yeah. I don't know. Shout out to Stu Locke. Stu Locke turned into white Gandalf. Like, yeah, dude. Like, I, you know what I think night. it is? I think red, that's just what happens when red hair gets sun. Uh -huh. I think that's what it is. Because <laughs> when you hear red the story hair, about how Stu went bald? I don't, it, was, it was a short story for sure. It was a yeah. picture book. It was in four weeks he, he went bald. In the course of yeah, one month. <laughs> yeah, I know those drugs. I just don't take them. <laughs> Shout out to Lock. Uh, all right, okay, we're we're not going to do another closing thing. We already did it, so we're. Just, I'm just going to stop the episode now.